So I noticed you were bringing in some sort of smoothie. Well, you know, mix. it's New Year's resolution. Time, you're right. So New Year, re New Year's resolution. New means, Year, New You. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, I wish I could be New You. <laughs> So, but well, so, you're both into smoothies, right? You guys are. I well, smoothie. she's a smoothie. smoothie. I'm using. I'm using. I'm just getting a protein drink. I'd like to get a little bit better control of some things. So we added a little, yeah, some sort of a, blender operation bullet. back there. Yeah. You know, it's interesting with the remodel. We have access now. I mean, I appreciate you coming in, bringing in fruit as an option, right? <laughs> right, yeah. Instead Trying of to keep hey, Andy, healthy. fresh food. I brought both this like candy. fresh fruit and there's cookies in there, so yeah. you're welcome. <laughs> Chris brings in donuts. We all balance each other I mean, out. We, we literally work right next to the cookie store, and uh, yeah, it's amazing. So, yes. it's like, stop, time out. Riverside Cookie Shop. I think we can give a plug for Riverside yeah. Cookie Shop. What's your They're favorite great. cookie? Uh, like, do you have a favorite? Chocolate chip. They have a classic chocolate chip that's amazing. Really? What What's I, your favorite? Anything with coconut. They have a chocolate with coconut and such. I really like that one. I guess, okay, so they have one. I don't think it has coconut though. It's called Campfire. It's kind of like a s'mores. That's a good one. All in a cookie, and that's my. Nice. Yeah. It's amazing. It's amazing. Cookie Cookie's a cookie, language. but it's not when you have somebody, what well, you have your preference, right? You... <laughs> I like how we toggle from smoothies to straight into cookies. <laughs> From healthy, to it's, an, it's an improvement in our conversation. <laughs> That's right. Maybe because we're all trying to eat healthy, but really, what we really want is a cookie. All right. Well, if we have a smoothie, maybe we need to go take a walk to go get a cookie. Yeah. No. No. <laughs> oh, sorry. No. Okay. <laughs> that is not an incentive. <laughs>
expenses, you know, the cost of the lemons, the cost of the stand, the cost of advertising, the marketing, whatever it takes mm -hmm. on his business. And he ends up what what we refer to as his net income. And that becomes reportable on his personal tax return. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's a very simplistic thing, but that is the most common business formation. Yeah, and Schedule C's, that's the, that's the part you put it in. You say, right. I, I ran a lemonade stand, spent $50 in supplies, I had $200 of income, so net, these are my taxes. So obviously, businesses go beyond the simplistic. Yeah, so yeah. What, what is the next yeah. most common? So when I think of it, and um, people think this as well, the, the very similar to a sole proprietorship is a partnership. The reason I think of them as similar is of just Billy. Now it's Billy and Susie together. Mm -hmm. They're doing the same thing. They might have some written agreement. They might not. Um, they are in it together. They are going to get some portion of the profits, but the same type of liability structure they were in as a sole proprietor that if you know, Billy's lemonade was poisonous, someone could go after Billy's house and Billy's car and all those mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. Now that you're a partnership, it, it doesn't change the liability picture yet. And so you have two people now and if someone had bad lemonade or they slip and fall in front of the lemonade stand, mm -hmm. you know, they can go after Billy and Susie's house and car and you know, assets. Mm -hmm. And so the partnership is a great way to simply and easily organize. And before we had limited liability companies, that was what everyone would do. So you think of real estate partnerships or things like that, mm -hmm. you, you kind of had to bind together in a way. And of course, when you're sophisticated in like a real estate partnership, you would have a written agreement, right. you mm -hmm. have all sorts of, you know, who gets the money, when, when do you get it, what if you want to exit, all, all those kind of bells and whistles would be in there. But but generally, if you have Billy by himself, he's a sole proprietor, and you build Billy and Susie together, they're now a partnership. And those are fairly similar in my mind, it's just how many people you have. Right. So right. you mentioned that as they form a partnership, two or more entities, they may or may not have a formal agreement. Well, what's mm -hmm. advisable there? If you wanted to start a partnership in the right way, yeah. what would be some of the articles of uh, you know, agreements, things like that yeah. need to be laid out. Yeah. So every entity, a partnership, limited liability company, corporation, all of those have the ability to have a written agreement. Mm -hmm. One they call your articles of incorporation. That's okay. incorporation. The other they call your articles of organization. That's an LLC. And then a partnership agreement is what they call the other. But it's the same thing. It's just kind of the rules of the road. And what's really, really useful and advisable is just setting everyone's expectations. I've had a lot of people say, well, we're partners. We'll, we'll just talk about it then. Well, it, you might, but by then the interests and the, the money is, is kind of made things a little more blurry. Mm -hmm. And so if people can sit down at the beginning and say, hey, how are we going to split the voting? And they're like, 50-50, easy enough. How are we going to split the money? 50-50, oh, easy enough. Mm -hmm. You can write down, what if one of us wants to leave? Well, I'll just oh, buy yeah. you out. Okay, perfect. Mm -hmm. But what if I don't have the money? Dies. What if, yeah, what if someone dies? And not that those can't be changed later and not mm -hmm. those can't be adjusted by agreement, by mutual agreement, but it's really, really useful to set down kind of the rules and the expectations of everybody mm -hmm. so that if someone does want to leave, everyone looks back to the agreement and says, well, this is what we agreed to. Mm -hmm. um, and that becomes your starting platform rather than people coming with, with your brain data. So well, for any of those, I would recommend getting some written agreement, even if it's just agreeing on what you, you know, innately already agree on, but just right. getting it in writing. Right. And so it sounds like you don't have to have an attorney to make those articles of formation, but it might be advisable, especially between, I would say, between an even number of partners. If you need kind of a, a third party or a voice that is non-biased, sort of, yeah. I mean, yeah. what would you guys advise? Experientially, uh, partnerships are the most common uh, business formation, but they're also the most treacherous. Mm -hmm. Because uh, partners really don't um, think about those events that could occur within that business arrangement where something could go wrong. Mm -hmm. The thing that I find the most common is that one partner feels that they are not appreciated for the work and, mm -hmm. and what they're putting into the mm -hmm. success of the business mm -hmm. versus the other partner or partners. And things start to break down. And since they have not really spent the time to really develop a business plan, and determine who does what and where and how do you measure all that. Uh, they just all of a sudden one day they started this thing because they had this idea. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes they blow up yep. and partners end up suing each other or the business goes bankrupt or it fails or whatever. And a lot of it is because they just haven't spent the time to really develop mm -hmm. the plan, right? Yeah, where are you going? And to your question, Laura, absolutely they should have an advisor with them. Yeah. The, the main reason is I, when I think of a new business entity, I think of 10 to 15 to 20 questions 
that she'll get answered right away. Mm -hmm. Where someone who's new at this might think of one, you know, <laughs> she, well, how are we going to split the money? Perfect. Mm -hmm. Got it. Let's go. Mm -hmm. So there's that ability to think through things, uh, which is really important of what it's mm -hmm. going to be. Uh, but the other item that I think is really interesting is day one, you have a good idea, you're in the garage, you and a friend, you high five, this is going to be great. You pick up a lawyer and you give them five grand to mm -hmm. create your company. That, that's probably not the first day one right. item Yeah. if it's your very first time. Making, top of mind. Yeah, you kind of got to get things going and make sure it's valuable. So there's a little bit of a, a layer there. I mean, the, the clients who are serial entrepreneurs, they've done this mm -hmm. once or twice, they have some experience, they call their lawyer day one or their accountant or whoever it's going to mm -hmm. be. And they get everything set up because they know where they're going to go. I've had a number of people that I've advised them. Like, you know, it's your first five grand best spent right. on, you know, in the, in the lemonade stand, you're buying lemons and, mm -hmm. and, and sugar. Is that your best right. first step? Or is it hiring an attorney to set up some documents for you? That's um, interesting. Cause I could see both answers being true, you know, for maybe a new entrepreneur that's looking for proof of concept. I don't even know if this is going to work. I've got yeah. a great idea. So maybe their first spend is putting together some materials and trying to do some market research yeah, essentially. Right. But once they're ready to move forward, essentially what you're alluding to is that $5,000 or whatever it ends up being is very well spent yeah. for the future of the company. And when everything is bright and sunshiny, you know, you don't necessarily want to be thinking about things that would hurt or harm or alter the future of your company, but those questions need to be answered. Yeah. That's kind of as, as businesses grow, you go from being a lemonade stand on the corner to at some point saying, Hey, we need a supply chain. We need a salesperson. We need some insurance in case someone gets hurt here. We need, uh, you know, all, all these different things. That go the distribution. Place. I mean, all the factors that go into a business and the success of that business, yeah. right? So if that business is going to take over the quarter and be a factory, they're going to be a, a real entity. Uh, if, if they are going to be uh, just a small little corner thing. Well, then that's just there for the weekend, right? And mm -hmm. that, that's part of when people think through what they're building. Are you building like a, a weekend adventure? You know, mm -hmm. you do it once. Are you building a, a real business that's going to need these things? Right. Mm -hmm. So business formation, I mean, we talked about sole proprietorship, maybe in partnerships, but there's also additional incorporation. We've got mm -hmm. LLC, you've got S Corp, you've got C yeah. Corp. So, the, the, yeah, the next line, we can talk through a little bit. So you have these, these sole proprietorship and partnership where there's really no liability change. You know, if you hurt someone while you're doing it, you hurt someone, you're liable for it. Mm -hmm. Well, legally, we've set up our, our country has decided you can have a corporation, which is a separate legal entity, and it can remove some liability aspect. And then came in an LLC, which is the same idea, a limited liability company. And what it does is it creates a new entity that exists just like a person might. And that person, that, that entity holds um, the assets, the operations. It also will be a, a buffer against the liability. Um, the example in the uh, lemonade stand, if, if something really poorly happened and someone was injured, you have this lemonade stand that might be liable up to the value of its lemons and boards, whatever the assets mm -hmm. are, but they don't look past it to the owners. They, they right. separate it. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason they do that is one, um, for, as you grow, it, it becomes a lot easier to have multiple people in this type of entity. Mm -hmm. Think of like a, like Apple stock. If I was a stockholder and, and the company Apple, um, was going down. Am I thinking that my house is is liable? That my car is, right. is subject to the company's debts? And back in the you know the great uh, prior to the depression, the great crash. That that's how it functioned. Mm -hmm. That the, an individual could be liable for uh, a, a company's uh, failure. Mm -hmm. Whereas now they, they they drew a line and said, okay, I'm only liable up to the hundred dollars I use to buy some stock. That so is, that's a great yeah. history lesson. Is did the LLC form after the Great Depression? Uh, much after, yeah. LLCs, okay. I think, were like uh, 70s, 80s. Um, okay, so they're more they're, they're fairly recent new, yeah, maybe even after that. Structure. Yeah, okay. LLCs are fairly new. And the biggest, when I mean, you think of the two of them, the, the biggest difference as you move from partnerships to corporations and limited liability companies is it's a lot easier to have a lot of owners. Um, and also, it, there's a ring of protection uh, around the, the personal assets of the owners. Mm -hmm. It's separating that liability. So a professional groups. corporation, you often find uh, attorneys, doctors, people mm -hmm. and accountants, they'll have a professional uh, a, a LLC, right? Is there a difference between that and um, somebody who just has an LLC that's yeah. a separate business? Yeah, good question. So uh, corporations come in a few different shapes and sizes and LLCs kind of just come in one, an LLC. Mm -hmm. And when California and many other states adopted the limited liability company as an entity that they'll accept, they said, well, we don't want everyone doing this. This is too easy. 
we don't want professionals to do this. We don't want doctors or lawyers to be able to do this LLC. We want them to still be corporations. Mm -hmm. So as a law firm, I can't be an LLC. Um, mm -hmm. They'll allow professionals to operate. Medical practices, you can't be a medical professional and be an LLC. Mm -hmm. And then you get to like, well, if it's a clinic, maybe the clinic can, but the doctor can't. Um, there's all sorts of rules. You need some advice there, yeah. Um, so LLCs are, are primarily for real estate is where I think is a really good one. A big difference here as we're highlighting these between LLCs and corporations is the is a tax item. Is this this pass through mm -hmm. of taxes? Okay. If you have you make some money and you have an LLC for tax purposes, they'll ignore your LLC and have that that income drop directly to your Schedule C, um, yeah. to your personal income you, through a K one that you'll get that onto your personal income. And so that money that comes in the company doesn't get taxed until it gets to the individual owner. So it's one tax. A corporation, on the other hand, mm -hmm. you get some income, it comes down, it gets taxed. You're talking about a C-Corp, right? A C-Corp, right. yeah. A corporation. So they, the C-Corp is just a, a tax code, but it's, it's a normal, corp. when you think of corporation, that's what you should be thinking of, mm -hmm. it's a C-Corp. Right. The money comes to the corporation, the corporation pays some level of tax. And then after that, is paid, it then drops the earnings down to the owners, and then they pay a separate level of tax. So we got double so taxation when layers. it comes to a C corp. And that's one of the biggest double complaints taxation. about C corps is that you've got a double taxation. So they'll issue dividends to the shareholders, mm -hmm. but they're taxed at the corporate level, and then the shareholders are also taxed for the dividend they receive. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So when you think of a big company, Apple, Google, Microsoft, it's going to be a C corporation. Right. Mm -hmm. That's that's really in our in our tax code. It's the only way to get a large you know, owned by a couple million people, you know, little bits of shares, large entity would be through a C corporation. They pay corporate level tax and they, then you as the shareholder, when you get your di dividends, you'll pay in your individual tax. So the, the, the one that you talked about is called the S corporation, right? Mm -hmm. Still a corporation, stuff to do all the same things. The difference is they say, well, if it's kind of a, a smaller company, maybe we could pass through this taxation and let it act like it's an LLC. Wouldn't that be a good idea? So it's like if the C Corp and the LLC <laughs> had a baby. got together <laughs> and had a baby. I mean, it's one, one way to remember one, it is the S Corp. And the S Corp adopts some uh, some some items from both. Yeah, it's, it's characteristics. That's right. It's structurally a corporation. It's structurally a corporation. However, for tax purposes, it looks a whole lot like an LLC. Mm -hmm. um, and there, that's, it's a nice flow through. But there's some traps here. And depending on what people are trying to do with it, that's one of the reasons to go back to your earlier question. Should you talk to an attorney or an advisor or mm -hmm. an accountant? Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just which one's better. It's it's which one's better for what you're trying to do. Right. An example, one, one aspect here where an LLC and an S Corp are actually a little different when it comes to assets is what they call appreciated assets. And mm -hmm. so if you have real estate that you purchased 20 years ago right. and people say, hey, you should put that in an LLC, probably good advice. You put it in there. It grows and grows and grows. At some point, the owner might pass away. And there's a yeah. step up in basis, meaning all those taxes, those capital gains can disappear for the next generation. That's an mm -hmm. LLC. Mm -hmm. In the S Corp world, same thing. You, you put your real estate in an S Corp. You bought it, you hold it for 20 years. It's appreciated. And the owner passes away. You don't automatically get that step up because it's and a that's, corporation. And that's a big deal. Let's, let's, if we look at a company that's been around for 20, 30 years, maybe longer. And in that particular company, they own assets, particularly real estate. They bought a building, they bought land, whatever. And then all of a sudden, the principal shareholder passes away. Yeah. Not getting a step up in basis. If you bought a piece of property for $50,000, let's say, 50 years ago, and now that same property is worth $5 million mm -hmm. because of development and just appreciation over time. What happens yeah, so uh, in that situation? Yeah, okay. The difference between what you spent and what it's worth, that whole distance, is all taxable gain. Um, usually uh, it's, it's at the capital gains rate, so it's like 15% or so, um, but that's a lot potentially. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you were holding it in your own name or in an LLC and that same owner passed away, all the, the, the basis that was what they paid for it actually gets brought all the way up to the fair market value. At so the, the date of death. At the date of death. And mm -hmm. so the difference between their basis and the, the fair market value becomes zero in essence, and mm -hmm. all those taxes just disappeared. And now there are some workarounds if someone does have real estate or some appreciating asset in an S Corp, talk to your CPA. There, there's some ways to work around to deal with that. It involves shutting down the, the company in the same year that you take the, the gain and the loss to offset. It's a little yeah. complicated, but, but there's some workarounds. But generally that becomes an issue for someone who is using an S Corp for their operating business because that's right. a good thing for an operating business. But they also have bought real estate in that same entity. That becomes a... a, a 
unfortunate event. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so often if I was advising someone, I would say to have their S corp be their operating business is usually a good idea. It's throwing off money. It's operating. And if they're going to buy their building or buy some real estate, hold that in a separate LLC mm -hmm. and you just pay rent over there. And then when so it, you get that preferred tax treatment at the end of the day, basically. Yeah. You get preferred yeah. tax treatment on the real estate and you'll get that step up later. And often if someone were to sell their operating business, like mm -hmm. some private equity comes in and buys it, they don't want the building. They don't want the real estate. They're very happy to buy the operating business and then leave you as the landlord mm -hmm. and then pay you rent for the next right. decade, which mm -hmm. is not yeah. a bad place. And then you have a pass through like an LLC in that situation, depreciation and other expenses yes. yeah. uh, pass through on your personal tax return yep. and it helps to reduce your taxable income. So there's different design structures. There. Yeah. So that, again, I think um, is really interesting. It's kind of the next level where you're actually talking about combining different business structures that might be ideal depending on what what type of business you have. Right. There's another general category. Again, we're not going to go through all the categories of entity formation, but nonprofit, like if uh, mm -hmm. someone's philanthropic and uh, we address this sometimes with retirees, they've always wanted to do some charitable work. Maybe they want to form an organization. How does, what does that process look like? Yeah, it's great. It's, it's a, mm -hmm. you first, you form an entity, whether it's a mm -hmm. trust or a corporation, you form something um, that, that's going to operate and do the charitable work that you plan to do. But then the, the key piece for that isn't just the formation. Now it becomes going to the IRS and getting a, what's called a determination letter. Do you say, hey, we are a nonprofit because we're, we're receiving donations from the public at large. We're using that money to benefit these you know, there's a, different classes of items. You mm -hmm. can do the, we're using it for good purposes that improve our community. The IRS will review that and they'll give you your determination letter. And that is what you can then present to uh, donors and for say, tax write off. You can write this off. Yeah. This is a, a write off. This is a five hundred one c three is what people are used to hearing, right. and that's a tax code to say mm -hmm. if you organize and approve. Yeah, five hundred one c three. Yeah. If there's you, also c sixes. There's other categories, but I think the most common is five hundred one c three. Whenever you hear like four hundred one k, four fifty seven, five hundred one three, it refers to the IRS code. Yeah. Yeah. A very specific code dealing with that particular the subject, subject right? right? Yeah. yeah. And in California, if you go and get your determination letter from the IRS, it's usually a three to six month process of mm. you know you form the entity. You have to explain what you're doing, why you're doing, why you're doing it, the the board, all the all different pieces you submit that to the IRS. The IRS then will give you a determination letter. If you take that to the state of California, they will basically give you a stamp that says, we agree. That's fine. We can do this. Okay. If you forget to do that, you know, California will then try and tax you in California right. for all right. the money that came in. Um, so it's a, it's a great way uh, to benefit our communities. But it, it's, it's a whole different world, I think. Uh, it, it starts with forming a corporation or a trust or something. Mm -hmm. But then you jump into this whole... Um, so if, I, if I'm a business entity, I start out as a sole proprietorship and my business entity grows, mm -hmm. what's my ability to change my business formation or my structure yeah. over that. time? Great question. Yeah. At any time you can change it. Oh, really? It, but there's consequences. Oh, so okay. if you, um, generally in our tax laws, you can take, um, the, the, what you've built and you can put it into a LLC or put it into a corporation and receive back the ownership interest and that not be a taxable transition. So generally you can, you can put it in there. Once you have it into the LLC and you say, well, I changed my mind now I want to get it back. Or you have it into the corporation. You say, now I want to get it back. I want to do something different. There is a whole area of law of business transitions and transactions mm -hmm. that exists. Mm -hmm. um, there's something called a triangular merger of we, big corporations will form a, a dummy corporation, which buys the stock and you move the assets and, you know, all that, we're not going to get into that. The, the, the reason they do that is to avoid the, the IRS viewing it as you're selling your whole business to another business mm -hmm. and they're going to tax you on the whole thing. Yeah, you know, what, what's amazing to me is when you go back and look at structures of companies and you see that signing one particular document changes the whole tax and mm -hmm. the, the perspective of the company for the yeah. future issues. Whereas not doing something can create tremendous liability down. And a lot of times people have contingent liability that they're not even aware of. It's yeah. just mm -hmm. kind of sitting in there like a time bomb. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some event occurs and they're going, I didn't know that. Well, mm -hmm. after the event, it's too late oftentimes. Ignorance right? is not always bliss. No, yeah, it's not. In that case scenario. And, and to your comment, as you grow, as your circumstances change, that is a, a wonderful moment to think, do I need to do something different? Right. Um, a, a big one is when a, a company is growing enough that their cash flows are, are strong, they then have to 
they want to buy their own building. Well, that's a great moment. I've had a few clients that just, they bought it. The corporation bought it. No big deal. We were taking the write-offs. Others that they took a moment and thought, well, let's buy it in an LLC. Let's hold it separately and let's move forward on that basis. So, right. and, and that's just one example. There's a number of those. So yes, you can change between the different ones. Um, and it's, it's good to be thoughtful. One just idea is if uh, Silicon Valley or um, San Diego, all these like tech startups, mm -hmm. they're all C-Corps. They're, they're, not, they're not looking for the, the pass-through of taxes. They're looking to grow it, keep everything inside of it, and then they're looking to sell it. There's some reasons why they'd want to be a C-Corp. But mm -hmm. if, if you're a, a tech startup tech company, it, it's a very different world than if you are an operating services company mm -hmm. or a widget company. Mm -hmm. And so it depends a lot of where you're headed. There's a lot of things that if you're in a business and you're in the formation or you're maybe you're more mature, mm -hmm. you need to have constant advisory services to take you through from step one to step yep. two to step mm -hmm. three to step four. And this could be from the very initial to the towards the end game, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've talked, we've had just a little bit. We've kind of talked on the highlights of some of these. Mm -hmm. But um, if you're listening to us right now and you're thinking, I, I don't know all the answers to this mm -hmm. and I need somebody alongside of me to help me make smart decisions about my money. We would suggest that you give us a call. We'd be more than happy to sit down and talk with you, talk about your business circumstances and determine what is best on how you should hold your business and moving forward, what are the decisions that will be best aligned with your goals and dreams and aspirations. Absolutely. So you can find more information regarding our firm at Tri TricordAdvisors.com. We're also on Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, all the places. But Until next week, folks. May you grow in wisdom and knowledge. Thank you for listening.